Okay, the topic of this video is Bayes' rule, uh, which was a, a very important rule of probability uh, that was discovered in the 1750s uh, by a man named Thomas Bayes, who was an English reverend, uh, and actually published after Bayes' death by his friend Richard Price in 1763. Uh, many people would be, consider Bayes' rule uh, to be kind of the, the granddaddy of all of the uh, the probability rules, okay? And, and I just want to give you a, a little bit of history here, uh, you know, a very, very brief bit of history. Um, if you go back to the 1750s and 1760s, uh, the major work on probability that had been published in that time was a book uh, written in the uh, 1710, 1718 specifically, called The Doctrine of Chances uh, by a Swiss mathematician named Abraham de Moivre. Uh, he actually wrote it in English since he lived in London for most of his life. Uh, now, uh, de Moivre's book, The Doctrine of Chances, uh, was, uh, to, not to put too fine a point on it, a book about gambling. Uh, it was about calculating the kinds of probabilities and odds that come up in the gambling and parlor games that 18th century French Swiss noblemen like to play with their friends and gamble money. Uh, and so uh, specifically, uh, it would allow you to calculate conditional probabilities. Uh, for example, stuff like, what's the probability that you're going to see three heads in a row uh, given that you're flipping a fair coin? Now, that's a particularly easy case, uh, but uh, de Moivre's uh, results, and of course, you know, we know what that's going to be. That's going to be one half uh, to the third power. Uh, but Demov's results allows you to calculate more complicated probabilities than this, uh, things involving combinatorics and coin flipping and dice rolling and all sorts of stuff. Uh, it was really the, the first major compendium of, of kind of modern rules of probability as we would understand them. Uh, and what I'll call this probability right here, uh, we'll call it the forward probability. Uh, and by forward here, I mean it's uh, reasoning in a forward direction from some assumption about the world uh, to some observable consequence. So stated generically, this is a probability of effect given cause. And de Moivre's results uh, would easily have allowed you to do that. Uh, but Bayes was actually interested in computing what he called, uh, or at least what later scientists would call, the inverse probability. Okay, and, and by that, we mean P of cause given effect. Uh, and so to take this example up here, uh, what would be the inverse probability? Well, let's say you observe the, a coin that's flipped three times and it comes up heads on all time. Uh, what is the probability that the coin is fair uh, given that you see three heads? Okay, uh, And we've seen several examples here uh, where you can't just go from one to the other. And what Bayes did uh, was invent uh, an equation, or I guess discover an equation, uh, from going from one to the other. Okay, uh, so I'll write it down here for you, and then we'll kind of explain it piece by piece. Uh, let's uh, we're going to talk about two events here. Let's say that the event B uh, represents data, uh, or evidence, or information that you've collected, uh, and A uh, is going to be some hypothesis about the world. So in our example above, B is the evidence that the coin uh, was uh, flipped three times and came up heads every time, uh, and A is the hypothesis that the coin is fair. Uh, and Bayes' rule uh, reads uh, like the following. It's that the conditional probability of A given B, uh, in other words, the probability of the hypothesis given the data, uh, is equal to P of A times P of B given A over P of B. And that's Bayes' rule right there. Uh, probably one of the most important equations in the history of probability. Uh, so what I'd like to do a few things here. First, I'd like to give you an example of Bayes' rule in action, specifically in a medical testing scenario. Uh, we're going to use one of our waterfall diagrams in order to calculate the probability of interest. Uh, and then we're going to go back and use Bayes' rule, and I'll introduce a few pieces of terminology about what these different bits of the equation mean. What do we call the P of A? What do we call the P of B given A? Uh, and so forth. Okay? Uh, so here's the scenario. Scenario. Let me uh, let me get a new page here. Uh, in fact, I need this page right here. So let's let's uh, take this scenario. Uh, so you're a doctor, uh, and uh, there is a 40 year old woman uh, who comes into your office for a routine screening mammogram. So we're going back to their screening mammogram example from earlier in the lectures. Uh, so let's say her mammogram unfortunately comes back positive, uh, which indicates that she may have breast cancer. Uh, but, you, you know, your medical training has taught you that no medical test is perfect. Uh, she may have gotten a false positive result uh, and therefore might not have cancer after all. Uh, so the question is, uh, what should you tell Alice about the probability that she has cancer in light of her positive mammogram? Okay, so let's let C uh, denote the event uh, that the patient has cancer. Uh, and let's let T denote the event 
positive test. Okay? Uh, and obviously not C and not T or C complement and T complement would be a negative test and, and uh, the event that somebody doesn't have cancer. All right, so here, what's the question here? The question is, what is the probability that somebody has cancer given a positive test? Okay, so, uh, you know, here's some relevant numbers that can help you judge. So these are numbers that are more or less uh, taken from the real medical literature. So first, uh, for every 1,040-year-old women who participate in a routine screening mammogram, about 10 of them actually have breast cancer. Uh, and so another way of saying that is that the prevalence of breast cancer in the population is 1%. Uh, and let's express that as a probability. The prevalence of cancer is 1%, and that means that if you draw a random person from, from this population, the population of 40-year-old uh, women, that the probability of cancer is 0 0.01. Okay, so that's kind of 0.1 right here. Okay, uh, piece of information two. If a woman has breast cancer, uh, the mammogram is reasonably accurate. Out of 10 such cancer cases, it will correctly detect about eight of them on average. So it has what you call an 80% sensitivity or an 80% detection rate. Uh, and how would we express that as a conditional probability? Well, that would be the probability of a positive test given that the patient has cancer, P of T given C, uh, and the medical literature tells us that that is 0 0.8. Okay? Uh, third piece of information. Uh, if a woman does not have breast cancer, uh, the mammogram has a small chance of resulting in a positive test anyway, uh, and specifically out of about 100 such cases, it will wrongly flag about 10 of them on average, uh, and so we would say that it has a 10% false positive rate, and expressed as a conditional probability, that is the probability of getting a positive test, T, given uh, C complement, okay, or probability of T given not C here. All right, so the question is, in light of these numbers, what is, coming back up here, the conditional probability that somebody has cancer uh, given they have a positive test? Well, I'll, I'll jump straight to the answer. It turns out that the answer according to Bayes' rule is 7.4%, 0 0.074, uh, which means that there is a 92.6% chance that this hypothetical patient entering your doctor's office is perfectly healthy despite the positive mammogram. Now, if this is the first time you've ever encountered Bayes' rule, that number, 7.4%, may surprise you. Uh, and, and if it does surprise you, you are not alone. It turns out that a shockingly high number of doctors get this answer wrong, too. Uh, in one famous study, uh, 100 doctors were given exactly the same information you're given. They weren't given equations. They were just told the information that I've just told you. And uh, 95 of them suggested or estimated uh, that P of T given C, or rather, excuse me, P of C given T, uh, was between 80 and 90 percent, okay? Uh, between 80 and 90 percent. So that's like 10 times higher. They didn't just get the answer wrong. They were off by a factor of 10. Uh, so uh, this example, I guess, provokes two questions. First, why is the probability P of cancer given positive mammogram, P of uh, C given T, why is that only 7.4 percent despite the fact that the mammogram is 80 percent accurate? And the second question is, well, how could so many doctors who were trained professionally to interpret the results of medical tests uh, get the answer so badly wrong? Uh, so to illustrate this, uh, you know, we're going to go to our waterfall, waterfall diagram, uh, which we had on a previous uh, example. But, you know, I just want to kind of give first up an intuitive answer to that first question. Uh, most women who test positive on a mammogram are healthy because the vast majority of women who receive mammograms in the first place are healthy. Okay, so the base rate of cancer in the population is quite small, and therefore the posterior probability uh, that somebody has cancer given the positive mammogram is still pretty small too. So let's actually page back and look at this waterfall diagram right here. This is going to capture all of those little probabilities uh, in uh, this hypothetical cohort of a thousand women. So mine is not quite as pretty as the one that those Cambridge University researchers uh, in, uh, sort of did up to, to show this. Uh, but here it is, right? So uh, we've got a hypothetical cohort here at the top of the page of a thousand women. So each little square represents 10 women. Uh, and of those thousand women uh, in this population who go in for screening, about 10 of them over here on the left actually have breast cancer and the remaining 990 are healthy. So let's follow this cohort over here, the 10 of them that actually have breast cancer first. So of those 10, well, let's remember, uh, of those 1%, those 10 people, uh, the test has an 80% detection rate, right? P of T given C is 0 0.8. And so about eight cases are detected and two cases are missed, 
Okay. Uh, so that's sort of following that half of the cohort. Uh, from those 10 women, we've got eight detected cases and two missed cases. Now let's come back up here and follow the cohort on the, on the right of the 990 women who are healthy. Well, of those 990 women who are healthy, roughly 100 of them will experience false positives, okay? And that's coming from the fact that P of T given not C or C complement uh, was about 10%, 0 0.1. And it really should be 99, but I've just rounded that off to 100 here to make the numbers come out a little bit more even. Okay, so we get about 100 false positives from this cohort uh, of 990. Uh, and the remaining 890 of those women are cleared. All right, so uh, let's, uh, let's erase all this. And now, having followed all of these women through, let's ask the question from this waterfall diagram, what is the probability that somebody has cancer given the positive test? Well, let's count up how many of the tests ended up positive. There are these eight, and there are these 100 here. So how many total positives? There were 108. And how many of those positives corresponded to true positives, that is, cases, uh, positive tests corresponding to an actual diagnosis of breast cancer? There were eight of them. And eight over 108 is about 0 0.074. All right, so from the waterfall diagram, that's how we get the answer. Most of the positive tests are from this half of the waterfall, uh, the the false positives rather than the true positives. Okay, so let me erase some of this, some of this uh, scribbles here. Now let's go do the answer using Bayes' rule. Okay, so uh, we're going to come across uh, down here, uh, and we're going to use Bayes' rule to do the similar, uh, do exactly the same calculation. So let's remember what Bayes' rule says. If I have P of T, I'm sorry, what I want, rather, is P of cancer given a positive test. And Bayes' rule says that that is equal to P of C times P of T given C over P of T. Okay, now if we come back up to, uh, to these facts that we listed about the medical test, we immediately know this part and this part. Okay, so P of C right here uh, well, we know that. That's the base rate of cancer in the population. That is 1%. Excuse me. Uh, that's 1% right there. All right. Uh, now, what about that? The P of uh, probability of a positive test given cancer. Well, that's 80% right there. So we know both the numerator and the denominator. Uh, and, and these uh, little pieces have words associated with them. So here, P of C is called the prior. So it's the prior probability of cancer. Uh, prior in the sense that it, it's your estimate of the likelihood of cancer before somebody actually has the, the test. Uh, P of T given C is usually called the likelihood. In other words, it's the likelihood of a positive test given that the underlying hypothesis uh, th that whose truth uh, you're evaluating uh, is assumed to be true. Okay, so that's called the, the prior right here and the likelihood right there. Uh, and then P of T is usually called the marginal probability. Okay, so we've got prior times likelihood divided by marginal. And you notice the one thing that we don't have in our list of facts up here is the marginal probability, P of T, and that's because we have to calculate it. Uh, and the key trick to calculating the marginal in Bayes' rule uh, is to use the rule of total probability. So P of T uh, can be calculated using the rule of total probability. And that is virtually always what you're going to do uh, when you have a Bayes' rule calculation. You will use the rule of total probability to calculate this thing. Uh, so let's go to the next page uh, and write out P of T using the rule of total probability. So remember, rule of total probability says that the, uh, the probability of getting a, uh, an outcome is the sum of the individual probabilities for all of the ways in which that outcome can happen. So there's two ways that, that a positive test can happen. You can have a positive test and cancer, or you can have a positive test and no cancer, C complement. Uh, and in turn, each of these can be written as the product of a joint, uh, I'm sorry, the product of a conditional probability and a marginal probability. So this is P of T given C times P of C, applying our rule for conditional probabilities. This is P of T given not C times P of not C. And we know each of the individual pieces of this equation. So let's remember, P of T given C was 80%, an 80% detection probability. 
The prior probability of cancer, P of C, was 1%. Uh, the false positive rate, the probability of getting a positive result given no cancer, uh, was 10% on the previous page. And then the probability of not C, uh, it must be 99%, uh, because it's 1 minus the probability of C over here. Okay? Uh, so uh, if you actually go through and, and do this calculation, uh, what do you get? Uh, you get, you know, just doing this by hand, 0 0.008 uh, plus 0 0.099, and that's 0 0.107. Just do that on your calculator. Uh, so now going back to Bayes' rule, we get P of C given T is prior. Prior probability of cancer was 1% times likelihood. The probability of detection, which was 80%, P of positive test given cancer, divided by 0 0.107. Uh, and what is this? Uh, this is 0 0.008 over 0 0.107. Uh, and this is uh, 0 0.747. Okay, so it's about 7.5%. And that's our base rule calculation. Okay, uh, so there's a there's a ac there's Bayes' rule in action, and you get the same uh, result as if you use the waterfall diagram. It's important to be able to do both. A lot of times, you're not going to have a simple diagram that you can work from. You're just going to be given information uh, in forms like this right here, and you're going to have to directly use that to answer a, a question uh, involving conditional probability. And Bayes' rule is brilliant for doing those types of calculations. All right, just a couple more uh, things to uh, to look at here. Let me give myself a new page to work with. Down here, add a page. Uh, so one thing I want to give you is just a quick little proof of Bayes' rule here. Okay, so quick proof. Oops, sorry, done. Uh, so quick proof. Uh, and this is really quick. It's like a, a two-liner here. Okay, uh, so we have uh, from our rule for conditional probability that P of A given B is equal to the joint probability P of A comma B over P of B. So that was uh, just one of the rules that we quoted. This is like an axiom of probability theory. It's the definition of conditional probability that we considered way back when when we in uh, introduced this concept. Okay, uh, well, I can also write P of A and B as P of B and A which by the same rule that we've just quoted here uh, is equal to uh, P of A times P of B given A. So all Bayes' rule involves is taking that right there and substituting it up here. So you, what's the result? You get P of A given B is P of A times P of B. I'm sorry, I uh, really messed that up. Let's try that again. Uh, it's P of A times P of B given A over P of B. Or said in English, prior times likelihood divided by marginal, if you want to use the terms for it. Okay? And what do we call this thing on the left? We call it a posterior probability. I've already used that word, but here it is. Posterior in the sense that it comes after having seen the data. All right? Uh, so, uh, last little topic to, to talk about here, let me give myself one, uh, in the context of Bayes' rule, let me give myself one new page here, uh, is the idea of a confusion matrix. So I, I really like talking about things in terms of confusion matrix, uh, matrices. Uh, it's a, especially when you talk about any kind of thing that's going to be classifying people or units uh, into one of uh, multiple categories, a confusion matrix is a great, great way to visualize those things. So how do we form a confusion matrix? Uh, what we do is we simply tabulate all 1,000 patients in our waterfall diagram uh, into their four possible combinations. Okay, so tabulate all four, all 1,000 patients uh, by disease status. So in other words, whether they actually have cancer or not, and test result. And by tabulate, I literally mean form a table. Okay, uh, so let's uh, let's make a little table right here. So over here on the left, uh, we're going to have C and 
not C. Okay, so these are going to be the patients here. There's a lot of C's here, right? That this C is complement, and that C is cancer. And I know it gets a little notation, a uh, little notationally heavy here. Uh, so, so maybe maybe it would be easier if instead of C complement, I actually wrote this as not C, so we we don't get confused here. Okay. So over here on the on the rows, we have the true state of nature, so a person a person's disease t uh, status, uh, and here we have T and not T. In other words, a positive test and a negative test uh, in those columns right there. Uh, so let's just cross-tabulate everybody according to those combinations. I have to go back to the waterfall diagram. So how many had a positive test with cancer? There were eight. How many had a negative test with cancer? There were two. So let's go back to our calculation over here. So here in this combination, had cancer and a positive test, there were eight and had cancer and did not have a positive test, there were two. What about for the people that didn't have cancer? Let's go back to the diagram to remind ourselves. So there were 990 people that, that did not have cancer, 100 of them got a, fall, a positive test, and 890 didn't, approximately, rounding off. So let's go back here. Uh, this number uh, would be 890, and this number would be 100 from that waterfall diagram. Okay, uh, and of course we get the marginal probabilities, right? So, th so what is uh, what is the the total over here? Well, there are ten in this row and nine hundred ninety in this row. Let's make a, an extra little row right here. Extend this. What's our total down here? Well, there are one hundred eight people that had a positive test and eight hundred ninety two that had a negative test. Okay, and and often you know that's why these are called marginals because they often sit here in the margin of the table. All right. So this is our confusion matrix, okay? Uh, it, it sort of classifies everybody in our cohort uh, according to whether they had a uh, positive test or not along the columns right here, and whether they had cancer or not along the rows. And it kind of gives you a one uh, sort of table summary of the performance of the test. And ideally, what you want is people to be along this diagonal, right? You want them to uh, have their cancer classified correctly with a positive result, uh, the people, these eight people here. Uh, and you want the people that don't have cancer to have their result classified correctly with a negative result. And the reason it's called a confusion matrix is because these off-diagonal entries here represent the test getting confused, where we get the wrong answer. Okay? And I'll also point out that you can very, very easily uh, work out Bayes' rule from a confusion matrix. So what from this matrix alone is P of C given T? Well, how many people got a positive test? There are 108 of them. And how many people of those 108 had cancer? There are 8 of them. And so again, we're back to our familiar number of about 7.5% right there. Uh, so that's the confusion matrix, uh, a great thing to present, you know, and, and, and honestly, you know, if, if it were me and, and, you know, you were going to your doctor, you know, the, the, the wrong question to ask, remember, conditional probability here is all about asking the right question. The wrong question to ask is what is the accuracy of the test? The right question to ask is what is the, the posterior probability that you have the disease given that you test positive? A lot of doctors will call that the positive predictive value. If you know probability, you just call it the posterior probability from Bayes' rule. So maybe the best thing of all to ask uh, when you have a medical test is what's the confusion matrix? Uh, of course, if you are going to ask what's the confusion matrix, uh, you should probably be prepared for your doctor to scowl at you because they almost surely won't know what that is. But they should, and they should feel bad that they don't.